Well, on Sunday night, we were giving a re reports from our trip over in Thailand called Bangkok Blitz 3, and uh, we got through the testimonies, and uh, we kind of ran out of time, so I wanted to take a few moments tonight and just show some of the pictures, and uh, we'll, we'll have a little bit of time in God's Word. But uh, anyways, I want to just kind of give a recap of some of the things that uh, we did over there. The objective, of course, was to distribute gospel literature into the hands of the Thai people amongst the other groups that were going to be there the Burmese and uh, some of the other foreign groups that existed as well within the country. Uh, we, we had a, quite a collage of people that we ran across and it was an exciting time to be able to share God's word in the very needy country. Thailand has uh, about 68 million people within its borders. 95% of them uh, adhere to a form of Buddhism called Theravada Buddhism, which is kind of a collection of uh, Chinese and, and Hinduism and then also something called animism where it's basically the worship of spirits and, and different things like that. But uh, it's a very predominant uh, viewpoint, if you will, or religion that is practiced within Thailand. What you see up there, of course, was our graphic. And uh, that uh, picture, that uh, structure on the side there, uh, is what's called Watarun, which was a major uh, worship center there in, in central Bangkok. But uh, our group of uh, about 25 individuals, uh, we're there for a couple weeks, as you well know, and uh, I just wanted to kind of click through some of the sl some slides here. A lot of these pictures uh, were on our Project World Facebook page and also our Instagram page. So if you've seen some of these, this is where they came from. If you haven't had a chance to look through some of them, I encourage you to do that. But this was our group. We were there in Los Angeles where all the, all, all the churches collected together before we headed over uh, to the Far East there, to Southeast Asia. As I mentioned, we had a group of about 25 individuals from five different churches here in the United States that uh, went and work together and and that was a real blessing they came from a, a couple from out east uh, one down in southern minnesota or uh, south central united states and then also here and then also up in um up in uh, North Dakota, and uh, the group really worked well together. We're so grateful uh, for the uh, camaraderie and the unity that was expressed by the group that, uh, that they came together for the purpose of glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ and making his love known to the Thai people. And uh, that was us before we had the long flight across the ocean and uh, got ourselves over, uh, like I said, to the southeast. Now, here's the group from, of course, Minneapolis. Uh, I think most of us recognize the people there. And then uh, this is the group that came out of Fargo Baptist. As you see, there was a lot of young people on this trip, which was really uh, exciting for us. Uh, I haven't had as many young people, at least in this age bracket, on previous trips. But this was a little bit different. But it fit very well, I think, with the program that ended up happening while we were there. And I'll, t I'll share some of that as we continue to go through the slides. Um, a lot of people, there was actually quite a few families that got involved. There was four sisters there, uh, a mother and her son, and then a father and his two children as well uh, that were part of that. We also, that does not include the Lang family, which added another six so we had really about 31 along with the missionaries that were over there uh, here's the groups are uh, some of the churches that were represented from uh, out east we we've got a group from uh, New Jersey from a church called New Testament Baptist Church in Columbus New Jersey a couple out of Lehigh Valley Baptist Church in Emmaus Pennsylvania and then a couple of uh, gals out of a church called Mount Zion Baptist Church in St. Clair uh, Missouri so sister churches uh, churches I'm well acquainted with and they they sent some people with us us. Uh, the two missionary families primarily we were working with were with the Hall family. Uh, again, they're out of Lehigh Valley Baptist Church along with Nat Williams and his family. Uh, they're out of the same church together. And they are stationed primarily up in the northern city of Mae Sai, Thailand. That's right at the northern tip of Thailand, if you will. It's right on the border with Myanmar. In fact, we had an opportunity to stand right on the border and look into Myanmar. I was hoping that we could cross the border, but due to this, the political uh, situation over there, they're in the middle of a civil war right now. We were not allowed to go across that border and into the country, uh, but we were able to at least see it. And uh, anyways, they work a lot with uh, uh, the peoples in that area. Brother Williams deals a lot with the Burmese. He's been into Myanmar in the past, and uh, uh, due to the political situation right now, he's not able to get in there, but he does uh, still have a great ministry amongst the Burmese there in Maasai. And then the whole family, they are primarily working with the Thai uh, people. 
and the, the Thai people there in Maasai, uh, amongst the other ones that are there. Then we have, of course, the Lang family we're familiar with out of Fargo Baptist, and they were there for a month as they are uh, seeking some different uh, direction from the Lord as far as their ministry goes, and uh, we had the joy of having them with us as well. Here we have the city of Bangkok itself. It is the largest city in the country, about 10, 12 million people, a large metropolis. Those of us that were there, uh, all we saw was skyscrapers and buildings all over the place, right? And it just went on and on and on and on and on. It's a very historic uh, city and, uh, of course, central to the country itself. And it was fitting that we, we spent some time there on the streets evangelizing in different parts of, of that of that city. And then you have also the city of Maasai, which you have there is a picture of the, of the Thai customs building that is the entrance, that is the beginning of the exit from Thailand, and you would cross a bridge and enter into the country of Myanmar. And we, that road right there is a main thoroughfare throughout the town, and we spent plenty of time up and down the, those streets and amongst the markets that are in there, uh, distributing gospel tracts and, and getting some opportunities also to witness, which is incredible considering that uh, Thai the Thai language is significantly different than English, but we would run across people that could speak a little bit of English as well. There was also foreigners there that spoke English, and uh, there was people that were getting opportunities, and not just uh, sewing tracks, though we did sew many of those. Here, we what we ended up doing is just the structure of our day, the way it worked out is is that we would have we would start our day uh, with uh, morning devotions and just spending time around God's word and praying together. One of the critical parts of our evangelistic campaigns in these different countries and different places we've been is the is the are the devotional times both in the morning and in the evening where we hear we hear some of God's word we pray we take testimonies and things like that and it just allows us to keep our eyes on the Lord one of the most important things that uh, in a campaign like this is that everybody keeps their eyes on the Lord because if we don't we're gonna have problems and it's very easy for the devil to get in, very easy for the flesh to get reared up during a very intensive couple weeks. And they are intensive weeks uh, where we are busy going about and working through logistics, not to mention just being in a totally foreign land and uh, to see some of those things. And you got some pictures here from some different places where we had our meetings. They varied a little bit depending on the location we were at. But uh, they were good times, and I appreciate the testimonies that come during those, those uh, points uh, uh, of the trip because they're, really, they're encouraging to hear what God is doing in the lives of individuals. One of the key things that you want in, in a project is for God to do something in the lives of, his, of the people, not just the ones we're reaching out to, but the team itself. These are very critical times where people have separated themselves for a time, uh, gone in this case halfway around the world, and, and it's a time where they can focus on the Lord and, and to hear from God. And I, I guess I liken it almost to a camp, um, but this is two weeks in a foreign land versus somewhere here in the United States. So there's some different, different things with it, but it's a really great opportunity for God's people to get a chance just to see God work in a, in a unique way on their behalf and answering to, and, and see really answers to prayer. And I've seen that many times over the years with different projects we've done where God's answered the prayers of his people. God's really gotten a hold of hearts over there in these types of situations. And a lot of times these things happen in these meetings. I know one, I think of one meeting in particular where we, we, got, we had a lot of testimonies and a lot of brokenness amongst the people. And that's a good thing because that means God's really speaking to the hearts of the individuals and really seeing uh, something done in their lives. And, and, I, and my prayer is that people would have come back from that trip seeing God in a more real way. And I, don't we all want God to be real to us? I know I do. I don't, want a, I don't want a dead religion. That's what I came out of. I want something that's real. I want God to be real to me. And what an opportunity these things have to do. And again, these, these uh, types of settings are the perfect spot for that. Here's the team of the first day of outreach, and we're, we're there at the what's called the BTS station, and uh, we got on different subways and, and, and sky trains and stuff like that. It's a little complicated there because every line you have to go and buy new tickets, and that created some, <laughs> some lengthy uh, um, lines for us and some, some patience that we had to exercise, but that was the group there. Our first day out, we, we 
were with a church called Lampro Baptist Church. It was in North Bangkok. And uh, they, the, some of their church members came out with us. And the first day, we had about 45 people on the streets. And uh, we got out a lot of literature that day and lots of opportunities to share the gospel. And uh, this was, again, the first day that we, we had out there. Don't worry, it won't be every day I, I will focus on. I'll get through some of this. Here you see some of the, some of the folks out there distributing uh, gospel literature. We got the one where we had a, quite a lengthy line sometimes going from where we were staying to the bus stop. We looked like a, a bunch of ants going through there. I'm sure we were quite the sight, uh, to say the least. We kind of stick out in that kind of, uh, in that kind of environment. But uh, it was still fun to be able to, uh, again, work together in these types of situations. Here's some more people, uh, some more situations. Um, we have up there in the one corner, I believe it was Bob and then uh, a gal from a, another church there. We're, there was a group here. I think Richie were probably with us in that. But we got out a little bit outside of the city. That was up in Maysai there. And uh, we got out in some real rough areas. And uh, it was just like, whoa, this is this is third world type stuff. Not all Thailand is third world by any means, but there were certain sections certainly were. And it's very eye-opening, again. I think one of the greatest things that a person can do from this country is go to the other places of the world, because then you come back to this country and realize you have it pretty good. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> you know, there's so many people that want to complain about America, they don't have a clue what it's like around the rest of the world. They really don't. And, and there's some places we saw, it was just like, whoa, this is, this is rough. <laughs> This is rough, and I, I, I chuckled as we were walking in some of those areas. Um, what Google Maps was calling a road, it was a dirt path. <laughs> I was like, "Wow, that's impressive. That's a road, huh?" Yep, it was, but it was it was anything like that. An example is what you see here. Some of them were, were uh, it looked like two paths, and then the middle oh, growing up with weeds. And Google said that's a road. <laughs> so uh, somebody evidently drove that at one point. But uh, again, we had, whether it was the big city or out in the country, you know, the gospel needs to get to everybody. And that was really the desire there. Here we got some more uh, action shots, if you will. You got Lisa there with uh, uh, somebody and uh, uh, reading a track. One of the fun things was uh, the track was really simple. It was actually more the information was found if a person scanned a, a QR code with their phone that led to a website that allowed them to watch a gospel video. And, and we had people say, we, we saw somebody scan it. And, you know, that's always exciting when you see people acting or reacting to that with the Burmese people, which we got to, to reach out more up in May Sai, you'd watch them. You, some people would sit there and, and just read them, uh, reading the tracks and things like that. I know Brother Williams was very encouraged by some of the things that he was hearing about and seeing with the Burmese as well. And, uh, anyways, uh, it, it's just a, there, there's so many people in this in this area. We would go by and there'd be just floods of people coming back and forth uh, as we were in some central areas where uh, buses would load and unload. And, and just, uh, there's, there's just uh, when you have 10, 12 million people in an area, they just flood from all over the place. And we tried to find areas in which we could interact with as many people as possible. Uh, here's uh, one of our groups out uh, during the day putting on bags on uh, uh, gates, as it were. Here, everyone's a gated community over there, it seems like, if they can afford it. And then another thing that took place while we were up in Maasai, they, have on, they had on the Saturday there, I can't remember the exact date that that took place, but they have in Thailand something called Kids Day. And uh, what, what it was is basically just a celebration for kids and uh, and uh, they had different events that would take place throughout the country. And, of course, they, the churches up there in Maasai uh, were using that as an opportunity as an evangelistic tool uh, uh, to evangelize the youth there. And our group really got involved in that, which was, like I said, we had a lot of younger people who were very excited to get involved in doing things from, from assembling games and, and uh, as you see, different things for the project. There was face painting going on. Uh, lots, of, lots of different activities surrounding that. And I, I believe uh, what ended up happening, uh, Brother Hall's a ministry I ended up seeing somewhere around 100 kids come through their doors and uh, brother Nats had about a 50 or so so great turnouts on both ends and uh, just again these are opportunities that they take to evangelize and it was good that our team was there they got there was a lot of interaction amongst the uh, the people and I, I think it's a very exciting thing for it, it kind of mixed up the outreach you know what I mean we, it wasn't just tr track passing 
it was witnessing and then also just interacting with, with these people along with the, the Thai and Burmese believers, as we'll see a little bit. We, we also took some time, of course, to uh, get, a, get a sense of the culture. We, we, uh, in Bangkok, as you see the one bigger picture, that's that Wata Rune. And right near that is another thing called the Grand Palace. Within it, they've got some complexes there. And they've got this Jade Buddha that sits up there. And, and uh, people go in and you literally watch them praying under this Buddha and worshiping. And as you see the one gal uh, up there in the corner there, she's sitting, sitting there praying. And they're as serious about that as anything. Uh, and they're very devoted in, in some cases. And uh, you, you just, again, begin to, to get into your own mind's eye about you know, the great need there in, in a country like that. I think it's important, you know, sometimes you think, well, that sounds like a vacation day. Well, let me just put it this way. The logistics did not make it a vacation day. <laughs> okay. But the opportunity to immerse yourself in, into what people are believing and doing gives you a good opportunity to let your heart be impacted. Lamentations 3.51 says, Mine eye affecteth my heart. And what we want to see, or what we want for the group, is to have their eye affected in such a way that uh, it does something to them, it motivates them, and, and inspires them to, to live for the Lord. Uh, we, we took a boat ride up uh, the a major river that goes through Thailand. I think it's called the Chao. Uh, I can't even remember how, exactly how it's pronounced it. Major river goes through Bangkok. Just, we'll leave it at that, amen. And uh, anyways, most major, major cities in the world have all been built on rivers, uh, obviously, in, in historic, because that was a major form of transportation back in those days. But uh, anyways, got a chance to go up uh, the river to those different uh, locations we saw just a moment ago. Also, we had a little fun with the elephants, and uh, that was awesome. <laughs> Uh, it was, uh, we had some people have, um, a little phobia, but they got over it because it's like, when are you ever going to be in Thailand again? You gotta, you gotta get on the back of an Asian elephant. And, uh, it was, it was a, it was a lot of fun, especially when the elephant started going into the river. I think I was, um, uh, Chardet and I were on one of the tallest ones there. And that thing got down where half of its face was covered by the river. So that's probably about eight or nine feet right there. And, uh, and uh, I was, we were behind somebody else up front who was a little nervous about being on the elephant. And I said, did your elephant take up his legs yet? Because they float down the river, right? And uh, she didn't really like me for that. But uh, anyways, it was a good time. I like this picture uh, where you got the posse going there of all of our people. That's us delivering the gospel to the Thai people right there <laughs> on the back. But uh, that was fun to watch everybody and uh, just have the opportunity to, to uh, have a good time and some of these unique opportunities you don't necessarily get stateside. We also went floating down a river filled with piranhas, snakes, and crocodiles. Not really, but uh, it, it would be a good story, wouldn't it? Uh, but everyone got pretty wet on this, especially some people, and uh, we just got to float down the river there, and, uh, and it was kind of fun in that area as well. Uh, there's a, this was up in the city of Maasai, uh, the, the one bridge. They have this glass see-through walkway and, that you could walk on. It was a little freaky. I mean, if you're not big on heights, the, you probably wouldn't have liked this. As you can look right down, it's about 40, 50, 60 feet drop. But it was beautiful because it was in the evening. It was all lit up, and you can see over to the country of Myanmar, and, uh, and you see the city of Maasai. And it, was, it was pretty neat. The, they, they had built up the area, and it was very picturesque of uh, Thai-related items. The one picture you see with the steps is a cave, a very well-known cave. If you remember a few years back, there were 13 uh, soccer players that were trapped in a cave in Thailand. Uh, due to the monsoon rains that filled the caverns up kind of in a flash flood type thing. And they were, and uh, they ended up rescuing, I believe, all of them. Uh, miraculously, it was, it was incredible, uh, the story that goes behind their rescue. But uh, that was just outside the city of Maasai, and we had an opportunity to go into the cave. We, don't, we didn't go as far as they ended up, uh, but uh, we got to see some of the things. They have some things still set up there uh, from that camp uh, when they were trying to rescue those kids out of uh, the caverns there. They had gotten back about three kilometers into, the, into that cave, and that's a long ways. <laughs> uh, they, they, 
the reason they got back so far was because they were running from the water, from my understanding, as it was filling up the cabins. You want to talk about a scary thing. Uh, nine days before they were even discovered, if, I think it was like 15 days until they were all uh, rescued out of there. And you imagine what it was like in that area. You know, it's dark, it's cold, it's, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. And uh, by God's grace, they were, it was a miracle that those people got saved out of that. And then we, we also went to an area called the Golden Triangle where three countries come together, Myanmar, Laos, and Thailand. And you could see across the river and in, in the area as uh, we, we took some time to look at that. But that's kind of a synopsis of uh, what we did there in Thailand. And uh, we appreciate, again, the folks back here who held down the fort and uh, prayed for us and, and uh, made it possible for the group to be there. And I'm excited about the next opportunities we have coming up, Lord willing, with the Paris Olympics. And then even beyond that, there will be some things as well. As the Lord allows us to do things, we, we, we plan to do it. Our passion is to get the gospel to the world as much as God allows us to in any way that we can. And uh, I appreciate you being involved any way that you can in regards to these types of things. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter number 3 tonight. I won't be long but Ezekiel chapter number 3, there's something I want to point out in this chapter here that really speaks to my heart, and I hope that it will to you. Before we get into the verse here tonight, I just want to mention a little illustration here. There was a noted English architect by the name of Sir Christopher Wren, and he was supervising the construction of a magnificent cathedral in London. There was a journalist that thought it would be interesting to interview some of the workers, so that he chose three and asked them this question. What are you doing? What are you doing? And well, the first worker replied and said, oh, I'm cutting stone for 10 shillings a day. Then the next person answered that question and said, well, I'm putting in 10 hours a day on, on this job. But the third said, I'm helping Sir Christopher Wren construct one of London's greatest cathedrals. Talk about that attitude, right? Now, I've been to London, and I've seen Christopher Wren's St. Paul's Cathedral. And, uh, and that's quite a spectacle over there. It's quite a building. But, uh, you know, as we focused in on Vision Sunday and tried to cast the vision for 2024, I want to just take our recent project and use it as a brief teaching moment for us from God's Word. Because I think there's some things that we can relate to the project and what Ezekiel experienced here. Because in our text, the prophet Ezekiel has been called to the Lord, or called of the Lord, to minister to a very tough group of people, difficult people. They were the Jewish exiles, recently who had, who had recently arrived in Babylon. And before Ezekiel says much to these Jews, God allows him to simply observe and sense the severity of the situation in which he would engage ministry. We're just going to look at one verse tonight. <coughs> verse 15. Then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Abib that dwelt by the river Kabar of Kabar, and I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. Seven days. Tonight, we're just going to spend a few moments looking at this thought of capturing God's vision. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this night. This time we could look into the Word of God. I pray that you would uh, speak to our hearts and give us a vision, give us a heart for the world that you have. And Lord, as we get opportunities to sit where people sit, may we not waste those opportunities, but may they be something that lodge within our bosom and inspire us to live for you in a greater way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, vision has been defined as the capacity to see. Pretty deep, right? And when we speak of vision in regards to God, it's often related to being able to see what God is seeing and acting appropriately upon it by faith. Because all vision begins with God. If you go to Psalm chapter 37, hold your place here in Ezekiel. Psalm chapter number 37 David is writing this psalm it's towards the end of his life. It's kind of a reminiscent psalm. It, it, it's an encouraging psalm for those who would come behind him and, and who would be, contemplate whether they should trust the Lord or not. And David really it spells it out here. Yeah, you can trust God. He'll take care of you every step of the way. And I find a lot of encouragement from this psalm. This is one of my favorite psalms of, of them. 
But it writes here in chapter 37, verse 4, it says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Here we see in the, this verse, the desires spoken of, I believe, are really the vision God gives an individual the desires that he gives. Sometimes, when I first read that as a saved person, I, you know, not knowing much, I thought, oh, God will give me everything I wanted, almost like Santa Claus. But it doesn't work that way, does it? Uh, God doesn't always give us what we want, and be glad he doesn't, because he knows that if we got what we wanted, sometimes it's not what we wanted. But, but you have here that God gives us desires, vision, if you will, they have, and we get that as we delight ourselves in the Lord. Now, the word delight in the Hebrew, the word literally means pliable or flexible. So what does this mean? Verse 4 is telling us simply this. If we are flexible, if we are moldable, or if we are surrendered to, to the Lord, he will give us the desires he wants us to have. He'll give us a vision, if you will. And that's, that's one of the biggest uh, challenges, though, for, sometimes for us is that, that surrender aspect, isn't it? You know, we, we, we want our, what we want, and sometimes God wants something different. But what God wants out of our life is a blank check. He wants us to hand ourselves over and say, Lord, use me in the capacity that you want to use me. And you know what? When we start doing that, then God starts putting desires there. And you know what? We have a desire to do something. And a lot of times it's in the ways in which we are equipped and we've been gifted. And, uh, and God will do that for us. Now, like as verse 5 goes on, commit thyself unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Commitment. Boy, that's something that's missing in the average uh, church today is committed Christian people. And you know, it, it, we, need committed, we need committed Christians People who are going to stick it out. Who when the tough, when it gets tough, they don't give up. They don't quit. They don't start getting self-pity. They don't, they don't throw in the towel so easily. Because if you're going to live for the Lord, they're going to face some difficult times. By the way, you're going to face hard times whatever, wherever you go in life. Choose your hard. It's hard to live for the Lord, but it's hard to live in sin too. Choose your hard. You know, it, it's not going to necessarily always going to be a joy ride. I know that's true. But you know what? Over almost 25 years of being a born-again Christian now, I can say that sticking with the Lord has been worth it. And I feel so blessed and privileged as a result of that. If you can stick it out and stick, get through the quitting times. I remember years ago we, when we were on deputation, we were with a church and the, the pastor had been a church planner himself and he said, you just got to get through the quitting times. You just got to get through those times because there's something on the, on the other side that you'll be glad you didn't quit on. See, God has a vision for us. He'll lay it upon our hearts as we give ourselves over to him and what he desires is that we commit ourselves to him walk in faith towards him, and in his time and in his way, he'll bring it to pass. He'll bring it to pass. You know, there are a lot of people in the scriptures who, who God gave a vision, and it took time before the vision became reality. I think of Abraham. Boy, it took 25 years before the vision became reality. In fact, he didn't even get all of it. He saw it only by faith. There was Joseph, man, 13 years and uh, God had given him a vision, but it'd be years before it was ever fulfilled. Now, it's not always that long, but there are sometimes some things are that way. You know, when it comes to our child rearing, you know what, you have to have a vision for what you hope that your child will turn out to be and, and work towards that direction. And you, and you take steps of faith according to what God tells you to do, and, and that, makes a, that makes a big difference. There's lots of things in life that take time before they're ever realized. And I believe God wants us to follow the vision he puts upon our heart because it's his faith-based goal he desires to accomplish <coughs> through our lives. Now at this time, God was calling Ezekiel into the ministry. And his ministry was not going to be easy. 
He was going to be one of the first prophets, if you will, assigned to bring the back, or begin to bring the Jews back to God. It takes 70 years to do that. <coughs> and they wouldn't respond all that positively. How would you like to be called into a ministry, called into a job, and God tells you they're hard as rocks, stiff-necked, difficult, and they're not going to respond well to you, Ezekiel. They'll hear you, but they won't listen to you. Boy, that would be really encouraging, wouldn't it? Can't wait to jump on that ship. But that was God's calling for him. That was God's calling for him. And he, and he, and he went through with it. Yet God was going to use Ezekiel, amongst others as well, to work with these Jews and eventually bring them back to the promised land. And if, you know, if you've ever read the book of Ezekiel, God reveals himself in a very unusual way to Ezekiel. Ezekiel sees the throne of God. You see that in chapter number 1. He sees the throne. He sees Jesus Christ, much like you see him in Revelation chapter 1. And he, and, he, and he sees God, and he gets a glimpse of God, if you will. And God did that for a reason. I believe he, he gave Ezekiel a, a clear view so that Ezekiel knew who he was serving. Much like Isaiah, when Isaiah saw the Lord lifted up, right? In Isaiah chapter 6. He saw his train fill the temple, and he, Ezekiel, or Isaiah saw the Lord high lifted up, and, and uh, that was used of God to help these men minister in those days. By the way, uh, you'll stick with ministry, you'll stick with God when you see God in a clearer light. You know why, God's, why there are people that fall away from God? is because the way they view God is so small, it's embarrassing to God. Their God, their God is so small, and they give up on him so easily. And that's why they fall away. The problems of life are, are bigger than my God. No, our God is way bigger than those things. And it would help us all to get a clearer view of God. Because the clearer view of God, the, the smaller man and our problems look. We need God. We need to see him in a clearer light. Now, part of Ezekiel's preparation, I believe, was to witness the arena he was to minister. And God brought Ezekiel to this place called Tel Aviv that was set on the river Kabar. And remember verse 15, it says, I sat where they sat. And that's the key verse of all this tonight. What Ezekiel was experiencing was meant to educate him. To educate him and to, I believe, inflame a passion. You know, mission trips are a lot like that because we get the opportunity to sit where those people sit. I've seen missionary presentations before and they've moved me, certainly. But it's a whole different scenario when you walk around and all five of your senses are engaged in a particular spot. You know, through our five senses, that's how we are, our minds or hearts are educated by the, what we see, what we taste, what we smell. And there were, some, there were some smells in Thailand. Let's just put it that way. Different food, what you, what you touch, everything, it's all engaging. And Ezekiel here in this, in this text here, he was engaged like that. He sat where they sat. He saw the sights. He smelled the smells. He heard the noises, the feeling, the taste. All educated him as it does us to the necessity of ministry. And to help us comprehend a clearer view of the need. Being in various places around the globe, I know personally, has changed my perception a lot about life. And why I exist here. Because you realize, when you sit where they sit, you get an understanding of what God's already comprehended about their need. You get an understanding of what God's seeing and feeling. And that's what God wants us to have as well. With the idea that we'll be we'll get ourselves more engaged. You know, this world is going to tr is trying to, its very best to steal your heart. It, it is. It's through its entertainments, it's through its its promotion, through what it emphasizes as important and sometimes we get caught up in it. See, God wants us to get caught up in what he's trying to do. 
and what he sees. We have to live in this world, yes. But but it's so easy to get caught up in our own little world, focusing on our own little things, and not realizing that there is a whole great big world out there that is desperate need of Jesus Christ, and you and I have the message that they need. And how shall they hear except somebody tells them? And when you get a chance to sit where they sit, it gives you a whole different perspective than, uh, than, you, can, than you can get just by, by hearing it or even seeing it, sometimes just on a screen. Again, I'm not against those things. I'm glad for those things. But it's a whole different understanding, a whole new level of comprehension that takes place that I believe God uses to try to motivate people and help us realize life isn't all about you. It's not all about me. It's all about Him and this world that, that is on a... This world's a sinking ship. And God wants us to be involved. You know, and I, we don't have time to go there, but in Matthew 9, Jesus had an opportunity to, to be up. He was ministering amongst multitudes, and it said that he, he saw the multitudes, He was moved with compassion upon them, for they were sh- like sheep without a shepherd. And he watched how they fainted, and just the way they were. And I, his disciples were right by him. And he, and he kind of cast the vision before his disciples to say, Hey, look, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And he was like, Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest. That God would, the, the Lord would send forth his laborers. Right? You know, basically, I believe God wants us to really get a grip on what's the most important thing to get involved in in life. It's not just our bills. It's not just our existing. It's not just our retirements. But it's what God wants to do to use you and I to get the gospel to as many people as we can. That's why we exist. As a church, and that's why God saved you, is to use you and use me. In essence, we, like Ezekiel, may get a chance to walk in someone else's shoes so we can understand what they are feeling and sensing and, may, and God can use that to really motivate us to, to get involved or at least fix our perception on, on life. We see here that Ezekiel was astonished at what he saw. And sometimes, we had a lot of first-timers <laughs> on this project. You know what, sometimes that can be very astonishing. I mean, it's just like, I didn't realize it was this way before. I remember a while back I was talking to an individual and I, I started talking to him about this individual. It was not a saved man by any means, but I was just mentioning that there were languages without a Bible and he was just like floored, really? I just thought everybody had one, <laughs> you know? Yeah, most actually don't in their own language. See, you never know that though if you haven't sat where they sat. You know, I, I believe Ezekiel here was astonished. He couldn't believe the conditions people were living in. He couldn't believe... I'm sure everything he was hearing, seeing, smelling, maybe tasting, was like, I can't believe this. I cannot believe this. And this went on for seven days. Not a long time. But seven days was educating Ezekiel. And I believe God was using that as he goes on. And in, in, if you were to finish off the chapter... He, that he, he tells Ezekiel, I've called you to be a watchman. And you're called to warn. If you don't warn, your, the blood is going to be upon your hands. But if you warn and they, they don't respond, then you're free from that. But you're, you're going to be my mouthpiece. Give the people a chance to know God and get right with him. The rest is kind of up to them. When it comes to missions, many who have gone to the field you have an opportunity to get a greater comprehension of what God sees when he looks down from heaven. And that can spark more dedicated service. Now, unfortunately, depending upon the decisions of that individual, it doesn't always happen, though, either. I've encouraged people many times, what you gain through these things, don't lose. Don't lose it. Because it's very precious. 
And it's my prayer that as a church, we really, that God would help us get it as much as possible when it comes to missions. That we wouldn't be content just necessarily giving a few dollars and that's good enough. No, but say, you know, I want to be call, I want to be involved in this great cause. And it doesn't always necessarily mean somebody's called to go to a place. Though I pray that someday that we could send people like that. But I think the best way for people to capture that vision is to experience it for themselves. Sometimes it can be a real eye-opener and a great reality check about what's most important. That's what it had been for Ezekiel, I believe, because Ezekiel's going to dedicate the rest of his life to serving the Lord. I'm very thankful for what God has allowed us to do again. And the last time we had the opportunity to do this was 2019. And by God's grace, we hope to do as many more as we possibly can in the upcoming years amongst the different outreach efforts we try to do about here. But I, I just pray that God will give us, or that we'll strive to become the best missions-minded church that we can be for the Lord. And you don't have to be a mega church to be that way. You just, have, you just need to have a few people who just have a real heart and say, we want to do something for God. The last thing I want to do is get through this life and not having done a thing. Or having done some things and then pull it in park, thinking, well, I'm done now. As long as we have breath, we are not done. So find your part. Sit where they sit. It'll change your life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. I do thank you for your word. I pray, the Lord God, that what we've experienced over the last few weeks, Lord God, would, would have helped us drawn us closer to you, given us a clearer vision of what you want done. And Lord, I thank you for everybody here tonight who had their part and did their part, whether holding the ropes back here or over there. Lord God, we all play a part. These things can't be done uh, without, a, without a team effort. And I pray, Lord God, that each one of us tonight would just get a real clear vision of what you want to do through this New Testament church and help us to fulfill it with all of our heart. Help us not get sidetracked. Help us not get excuse-ridden. Help us not get self-centered. But help us to put our eyes on you and do what we have been called to do for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll just take a few moments. You can be seated with every head bowed and every eye closed. We'll just play. If God has spoke to your heart, I want to just give you an opportunity. We won't stand tonight just for the sake of time. But if God has spoke to your heart tonight. Now spend some time with the Lord. You know, there are opportunities even around this Twin Cities area where you can go sit where they sit as well. Go to a shelter. Go to a jail. Go to some of the ethnic areas. You can sit where they sit. Go to the college campuses. Walking up and down some of the streets. Let God impress upon your heart what he wants you to be involved in. You know, God wants every soul to be have the opportunity to come to know him as Savior. Tonight, do we have that burden? Do we have that desire? Do we have that passion? Or do we are we gotten a bit distracted with life? Maybe gotten a little bit too self-focused? May we not get that way tonight. It's very easy to get that way. But we get so consumed about self. Yet there are countless millions who have still yet to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and don't think that your life and my life don't make a difference it does it does every life makes a difference but we have to be in tune with the will of God we have to be in seeking that more than all than, than anything else 
because anything outside the will of God is not worth it. May God help us tonight get brokenhearted over what, what he wants to do. We have a nation today that is in desperate need of Christ. May it cause us to fervently pray, give, and go. Father, we thank you for this night, this time in the Word of God, and this time we can, again, just contemplate some of the things we've been through over the last few weeks. And Lord, I pray that uh, we would really get a hold of uh, the cause of Christ as we see a, you in a clearer way, as we fall more in love with you. I know your passion, Lord God, will fill our hearts. Lord, help us to be that minded tonight and that you get all the glory and praise from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. Just a few quick announcements before we're dismissed. Again, we have a few sign-up sheets out in the hallway uh, in regards to the prayer partners. If you have a prayer partner, uh, please sign up with your email address, and then we'll start getting those uh, uh, those out uh, this next week, and uh, you can start that. Thank you for those who have signed up. We got a nice little crew signed up already, uh, but as many as we can get would be would be great. Uh, sign-up sheets for the Mighty Men's, the 24-hour prayer chain. Feasts of Charity, there's several out there, so whatever pertains to you, uh, please sign up and be part of that. This uh, Saturday we have outreach at 1030 as we are starting to put out the invitations for the Friend Day. And uh, looking forward to a great day on Sunday. Invite somebody to church. Try to bring somebody with you uh, however you can. And uh, we're praying for that God will give us a great day as we round off January. Winter's almost over. Just think of that. It's barely begun, it seems like. And uh, anyway, we'll, we'll have a great, uh, great uh, end of the January celebration, if you will. And uh, then we'll get on to February and the things that God has for us then. Neil, why don't you come and just close with a word of prayer here tonight, if you could. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for, for this evening, Lord, just being able to uh, see what all um, you did through the people that went uh, to Thailand.